In this lecture, we're going to define directional derivatives. The etymology of this phrase is it's a derivative in a particular direction. So we're looking for the rate of change of a scalar valued function of multiple variables as we move from a point in the domain in one particular direction. So this notation here is let f be a map from its domain, which is a subset of n-dimensional space, for example, r2 or r3, to real numbers. So d sub f again is the domain. Typically, we work in r2 or r3. And f maps us into scalar values, so f is a scalar valued function. Imagine we're at some point a in the domain of f. We would like to check how f changes if we move in a particular direction away from a. We describe that direction with a unit vector v and say that the rate of change of f at a in the direction of v is the limit as h goes to zero of f of a plus h times v minus f of a divided by h. So this is a limit of a difference quotient, therefore it's giving us a rate of change for this function. We have a change in outputs in the numerator divided by a change in inputs. So what this change of outputs is saying is imagine we're at a and we perturb a little bit in the v direction. So we take a small step in the direction of v. How does this output compare to where we started? So this is why we're measuring the rate of change in the v direction. It's important here to use unit vectors. If you set this calculation up and v is not a unit vector, you could get a different answer. So by agreeing that we all use unit vectors to measure the rate of change in a particular direction, we standardize our calculation. So if you and I both want to calculate the rate of change of a function, if we move to the east, we want to get the same answer. Okay, let's do an example. Suppose f of x and y is x squared plus y. Let's find the rate of change of f at the point one zero in the direction of one comma one. In other words, one unit to the east, one unit north. As given, this is not a unit vector, so let's make it a unit vector by dividing this vector by its own magnitude. The magnitude is square root of two, so we'll get v is the direction one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two. We have our function, we have our point, so the point A here is the point one zero. We can compute the limit of the difference quotient that we need. So this directional derivative of f at the point one zero in the direction of one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of f of one zero plus h times one over the square root of two one over the square root of two, that's the first output in the numerator, minus f evaluated at the point one zero, all over h. So this will be the limit as h goes to zero. Let me first simplify that first output for f. So that's going to be f of one plus h over the square root of two, comma zero plus h over the square root of two. So it's f of one plus h over the square root of two, h over the square root of two. Then we subtract off f at one zero and divide the result by h. Now we can evaluate f to get our numerator. So this is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of, we need the first coordinate squared. So that's one plus twice h over the square root of two plus h squared over two. And we have to add to that y, so that's plus h over the square root of two and then subtract off f evaluated at one zero, so that's minus one squared plus zero. Okay, that was our numerator, and then we divide everything by h. We see the ones cancel. And after canceling out those ones, every term left in the numerator can be divided by h, so I'll do that as well before the next step. So this will be the limit as h goes to zero of two divided by the square root of two, which is actually just square root of two, plus h over two, plus one over the square root of two. Now we can let h go to zero 
and we're going to get a total of 3 divided by the square root of 2. So that's the directional derivative of f from the point 1, 0, moving in the direction indicated by 1, 1. So that is our sense of direction, but in order to do the computation, we needed to take that direction and make sure we describe it with a unit length vector. What have we actually computed? Well, here's the xy plane. That's the domain for this function. And then here's the point 1, 0 described with its position vector. At this point, f took the value 1. So f of 1, 0 was 1. The question was, how does f change if we move in one particular direction? So as we move in the direction of 1, 1 from this point, so 1 unit to the east, 1 unit north, that kind of direction, how did f change? And we can say that f increases in that direction because here we have a positive rate of change. I have just a few other remarks to make about the directional derivative. What if the sense of direction that we're trying to understand is in the i direction? So that's the direction described by the vector 1, 0. Then if I set up my directional derivative, it's going to look like this. The derivative of f from some point a, let's say a comma b, so some point in R2, in the direction of the i vector, would be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a b plus h times 1, 0 minus f at a b all over h. So we simplify the first expression in the numerator and we're going to get the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h comma b minus f of a comma b divided by h. You may recognize that that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x at the point a, b. And that should make sense because we're measuring a rate of change in one particular direction. So if that direction is in the i direction, that's measuring the sensitivity of this function with respect to the first input. If our direction were described by the j vector, we would be computing df dy. That helps us understand visually what we've computed when we compute a directional derivative. When we computed an x partial derivative, we said that that was like slicing into the graph of this function with a y equals constant plane. So if you look in this first picture, I have the graph of what's actually a paraboloid here and sliced into it with an x equals constant plane. Let me say x equals the constant value a. Then we said that we were differentiating f with respect to y, and what that was computing was, say, the slope of tangent lines to this curve of intersection. In the middle picture, we're slicing into this with a plane of the form y is a constant, say y equals b. This would be computing x partial derivatives, just like the rate of change of this function along this curve of intersection. Now here I'm slicing into this paraboloid with the plane which is at an angle. And that's what this directional derivative allows us to do, is measure the rate of change of f in other directions. So instead of only being able to slice with planes parallel to the coordinate planes, we can now slice into this function differently. So directional derivative generalizes our notion of partial derivative. It's measuring the rate of change of the function in just one particular direction. But that direction doesn't necessarily have to be the x direction or the y direction. We'll have more to say about directional derivatives a little bit later, but I'm going to end this lecture here. Thank you for your attention.